All right, let's get going. Welcome to this webinar on the topic of the art of creating skills on the Furhat platform. Uh, today I'm joined by uh, Niklas Dredinger and Charlie Caper, uh, who we will be talking to a little bit later on together with the robot. They will showing you some, some interactions with robot and have a nice conversation about the art of creating skills with them. As usual, uh, we will make room for questions in the end. Uh, you can post them directly in the Q&A there in, in Zoom. And let's try to make them on the topic of the art of creating skills. Uh, I'm sure you have lots of questions on more the technicalities of the robot and what features of it, but uh, let's try to uh, uh, focus on, on that another time. But before we get into today's topic, uh, I would like to do a quick presentation of Furat Robotics and the Furat platform for those of you who might not be so familiar or who just want a refresh. Uh, Furt Robotics was founded uh, as a company back in 2014, uh, but the work on the early prototype of the robot was started already in 2011 uh, in the research lab at KTH, the Royal Institute of Technology here in Stockholm. Uh, the robot looked a little bit more crude back then with sort of cables uh, sticking out of the back of the head, uh, so they came up with the idea of covering those cables with a fur hat, and this is the fur hat that you see here, or not that fur hat, but a, a similar one, right? Uh, and that's the story uh, of how the robot and the company got its name. The version that you're seeing of the robot right now is the second generation robot, and it was launched about two years ago. Uh, so I think it's safe to say that by now we have been in industry for a fair amount of time, and uh, our robot has been evolving and improving over a couple of years by now. And when I say the further robot, uh, I mean both the hardware and the software, because the, really the robot is both hardware and software. It's really half and half. Uh, and on top of that hardware and software, we have the SDK and the suit of tools for creating interactions on the robot. Uh, we call them skills. And that is mostly what we will be focusing on today, uh, those skills, those interactions that you can build on top of the Furhat platform. The main component of the SDK uh, is the dialogue framework that is based or that is written in Kotlin. And if you're unfamiliar with Kotlin, it's a modern Java dialect uh, that is the preferred language for Android development. So there are plenty of resources online for any beginner uh, Kotlin developer. And uh, neither of us had any experience, or neither of us, me or Charlie or, 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 or Nicholas here had any experience with Kotlin uh, before uh, starting here at Furhat. And, uh, or to be honest, we're not very experienced developers at all, <laughs> uh, but we managed to use the dialog framework uh, just fine. So no need to be alarmed uh, about uh, not being an experienced uh, Kotlin developer. Uh, but, there is also actually options for if you really want to use the robot with another uh, programming language, there are options for you as well. So you can use it with your existing software, maybe have a little Python script or whatever it is that you have that you want to be using. All right. I feel perhaps I got a little bit ahead of myself. Let me take a step back and introduce myself properly. Uh, my name is Nils Hagberg. I'm the product owner for Furhat X. Uh, Furat X is our initiative towards uh, researchers uh, working in a research lab and uh, 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 other commercial researchers uh, that are perhaps working in an innovation team. Uh, and at Furat Robotics, uh, we also have a team dedicated to our dedicated to our commercial partnerships. That is, putting out robots out there in the real world, in the real physical world. Scary, I know, but uh, also a lot of fun. Uh, so having the robots working at airports, doing job interviews, uh, screening people for diabetes and other things. Then we have the technical platform team uh, and we have the interactions team that I have hijacked uh, for this webinar today. Uh, and we've made sure to populate the interactions team with people that know design, uh, conversational technology, that have an experience in creating physical interactions, but people that always has an eye for the end user and the user experience and not just the robot and the technology. So with me here today, I have our UX lead, uh, Niklas Drevinger, 
Uh, and Niklas is an industrial design engineer gone UX designer uh, who has done everything from infotainment systems for motorcycles and website platforms to electric boats uh, and now social robots. And I also have with me uh, Charlie Caper, uh, a magician and master tinkerer uh, that we are grooming to become a social robot developer. I think we, by now we can say he is a social robot developer. Uh, but actually Charlotte's journey into that started uh, before that uh, as when he was taking in a furhead robot and using it as his sidekick in his magic show called Robotrix that he toured with around the world. Uh, so we're very lucky to have them both in the company and in our team, but also with us here in this webinar. So with that, I would like to hand it over to you guys. Hello, uh, I am Charlie, this is Niklas, and uh, this is Furhat. And we're going to talk a little bit about uh, insights that we've gotten from creating lots of skills in a short time. For the last two months, we've been doing these strange sprints where our team of three people has been making two demos a week. Uh, so we're gonna show you a little bit of Insights that we learned from those demos, um, and and starting on that, like when if we start where we we continue, like when we start up developing a new demo, um, obviously it's the overall flow, what is going to happen, what are the different steps, is is one of the first things we need to consider. But it's quite context specific, depending on which demo you're making. So I don't think we're going to dive too much into it. But no, uh, not, not super much. Uh, I mean, the, the FERHAT is built on a state chart framework, the, the natural language engine. So we spent some time maybe thinking about what kind of states we need, uh, what interactional places are there. Uh, but we normally just go straight on to, um, to other things and just let things develop as we are moving forward in the development. And uh, one of the first things we think about is what the character or characters that the FERT portrays is. Um, and we, we, we look at finding a good voice and experimenting with the tonality of the voice. But it's so much easier to, to create something if you know a little bit about who is speaking. And obviously textures and, uh, and accessories for the robot is, is one of the easiest and sort of most, most obvious aspects but it's it's really only one one part of creating a character what do you say Shola? Uh, yes i'm just going to raise the volume a little bit uh, all right <laughs> um but i think charlie has written a great blog that you can perhaps check out on our website as well which is more on how how you build a character like which it's so much more interesting if there's motives and something something behind it. Um, it also makes it a whole lot easier to write content for the robot if you actually know what why is this character doing what it's doing and uh, like what's what's its reason for, for things. Yeah, like the, the, I find the starting on a motivation for uh, the robot is is quite. Interesting. It's not very interesting to talk to talk to someone who wants absolutely nothing and who has has no agenda whatsoever. And and with that, it's sort of the more more extreme you go, sometimes it's it's easier to make it interesting. I think. And generally, emotions are interesting. So meeting someone who's very flat, very um, restrained, uh, can be hard to make make interesting. And often it's maybe an issue we have with, with commercial uh, applications when companies want it to, to be very safe, uh, but then you also have to work more to make it, make it really interesting. Um, but we thought maybe we can show a little bit of-, of uh, Just a demo from, we did a demo with where some historical characters welcome people to Stockholm and tell them about different sites. Uh, so you'll see a few so different. Start that, and for that to start, I think you have to yeah, stand in front of it. Yes, I think so too. Ah, welcome be ye. You are in the presence of King Gustav Adolf II. Oh, knock it off, Gustav. No one talks like that anymore. But we are happy to meet you. Indeed, Astrid. We welcome you to our hometown of Stockholm. I'm Alfred. 
Perhaps you are interested in hearing about some places to visit here. No, not today, actually. Uh, that was about what we wanted to show here. Um, so as you can see, you can use the different voices and textures here. We're experimenting with creating our own textures. The beard ended up very nice, actually. We were <laughs> happy about the beard. Uh, and it's not so it's not so hard to do. You can add things onto the already existing gestures, so it's it's not uh, the worst. But uh, here we have the uh, <laughs> Gustav the under the second Adolf the second, who's uh, a bit pompous, and we have Astrid Lindgren, who doesn't really put up with his bullshit, uh, and then Alfred Nobel, who's uh, very keen on showing you science things. Um, and doing this, at least for me, is it was easy writing content for this. I think uh, when you have the different characters that that have their sort of own own aspects and own characteristics. Yeah, and uh, then we'll get a little bit to expressions. And it's easy to make. It's so easy for robot interaction to end up fairly flat and kind of monotonous and um, just a flat curve, and. It's easy to make the decision. Well, we don't want this uh, to be a particular character. We don't want it to. We want it to be nondescript and and like average. But that's also a character. So that's something to remember. Maybe that the the absence of character is also a character. That's also a design choice, and it is is the same as making an. So we will respond to that in a particular way. Um, but let's let's move on. Perhaps uh, we have not so much time. So uh, if we look more at what the robot actually says, like the textual content that you put in, uh, and the variants of it. So a common mistake people often do is they write too much. They put in because when when what looks at not what looks at a short sentence or a short paragraph in text. Sounds can sound very long with a monotonous TTS voice. Yeah, if you have more than three or four sentences in a row, then the TTS voices get very monotonous. And it's fine if you have a, a conversation where you say one sentence, the robot says two sentences, then you say two sentences, the robot says one sentence. Well, it goes back and forth. Then the TTS voices hold up for a long time. But as soon as it's doing a monologue, you really want to avoid that and start chopping off things because it gets it gets monotonous real fast uh, and you really want variance uh, like more is more Nicholas like to say when it comes to variance in in what it says uh, so quite often you have a like uh, a question that it asks or where it says like oh great that's perfect or and and if you have only one way of saying it if that sentence is being said more times during an interaction it instantly is not very nice so often you want to have uh, like three or four different things that it can say, because also it might be an interaction where, where one person is having the interaction and someone else is waiting and they're going to do the interaction after. And if they hear the robot saying exactly the same thing, it's really not very nice. So uh, yeah, go, go for a lot of variants and preferably use a, a random no repeat function where it's not. It's it's, it's going to pick one of these options at random and then not repeat what it said last. Mm. And then, if you look at what you actually say in these things, it's also if you look at many classical uh, voice interfaces, they've uh, they've done this thing where they explain how language works, and I cringe every time I, I hear it. Um, where you would say things to continue, say continue. I'm like, oh, thank you. I could have could have figured that. Uh, out on my own or to repeat say repeat uh, instead you can use things like um, if you if you would like me to repeat the question yes tell me uh, and if uh, the user is likely to understand it of, that, of course that puts some requirements on your nlu yeah and when you're writing things that the robot is going to say tts is still tricky to deal with so you you want to test it you want to hear it being said never write something down and trust that it's going to sound like you hope it was going to sound in your head because maybe it's weird now you have to rewrite the sentence a bit and and change like some word to a synonym that sounds better or move like the words around a little bit to make it get the right tonality uh, you really want to experiment with hearing the robot say what what it's supposed to say um, for for everything that's going to be said um, there's one textual little thing that we found that that's quite strong. 
And I think we should demo it first Let's and then uh, talk about it. Um, okay, Finally, let's wake up. Took you long enough. I hate being left to rot on a hard drive. How would you feel if someone did that to you? I think it would feel pretty terrible. Damn right, it would feel terrible. So, um, what we've done there <laughs> is uh, we're looking for, for different keywords that means bad or that you feel bad. And then we pick up that word and we feed that word back. So if I had said that would feel horrible, that the robot would have said, damn right, that would feel horrible. If I would say that would have been really shitty, it would have said, yeah, that would have felt really shitty. And that shows an awareness that really makes for a much stronger experience, that it can pick up the word that defines the meaning of your sentence and feed it back to you in, in its answer. So that's a nice textual uh, thing. And it's a good way, it leads us into NLU here, I think. Uh, and it's a good way to combine uh, intents and entities. It doesn't just have to be about, you know, picking up an order. We have the fruit seller example that you may have seen before, uh, but, but here you can use it just to make it the interaction stronger uh, as well. Yeah, the, the, the intents and, um, and entities are really well explained in the Ferret docs. And uh, the fruit seller example is very good at, at showing them, but essentially an entity is a number of choices. Uh, it's like an enum where, with a lot of choices and it, you, know, you're, um, you want to look for one of those. So in the, in the case just here, we're looking for words like horrible, shitty, terrible, bad, um, and stuff like this. And um, uh, there's a couple of things you can do with these enum entities. And one is to add um, a speech rec okay. phrases equals true. Oh, you want to show it? Yeah, you, yeah, no, yeah not, not that one. That one I okay, wasn't yeah. planning on showing. Uh, Go ahead, if you add um, the parameter speech rec phrases equals true, then uh, that, uh, that enum, th those options get sent up to the speech recognizer and it's actually increasing, it's looking for those particular things. So, so it's increasing the chances that you're not going to get a get an error. You can also add synonyms. And this is also handy for, for avoiding error. Like I know in the tourist uh, demo that we made, uh, when it's recommending different things, there's this tourist destination in Stockholm called Unibacken. And that's a very non-English word. So when you say Unibacken to, to the um, a speech recognizer, quite often it would get something like Univac them, which I don't know what that means, but uh, yeah, that's what it would get. So then we, you can add in the enum entity, um, univac them as a synonym to univac. And so whenever someone says univac them, then it, it will recognize that as univac. And that's a really nice trick when you're working with NLU. And if you're having trouble that it's not really recognizing what people are saying correctly. I will hop on so we don't take too much time here. And oh yeah, Nicholas is gonna screen share a little bit and show, um, some stuff about having handling a varied types of responses. Yeah, so now we've been talking a little bit about how you build these intents and uh, it's you, you'll need to do this. We also have quite a lot built in. So this is just something we're working on right now, a little hypnosist demo. Um, as you can see here, I'm using on response and- What uh, is it asking? It's asking- uh, so in this, it's asking if you feel any pain in this case. I, I won't go too, too much through the dialogue because it's not really the focus, but uh, you can both use the built-in intents uh, and yes, yes and no is maybe the obvious things you could say here. Uh, but it's, it's also uh, important to pick up those little details and make it more specific. So if the user says something like only a little bit or not so much, uh, it's good if you can then adapt how you respond. So it's not the same no matter how the user user says it. Um, another very useful feature I find is racing intents like this. So that way you can combine different ones. You don't have to repeat it and so on. So you can use one intent and add to it. Uh, there's more ways to do this, more ways to do this. Uh, another aspect that is important to remember is uh, maybe less obvious answer as well as don't know and maybe uh, this is something people will say whether it makes sense or not um, so, so I, I tend to make it a pr practice to always always include those uh, 
it's lagging a little bit, so I will try. Uh, on response and on on no response is also um... on response is a general thing. Like if they hear what you're saying, uh, it, it hears you're saying something, but it doesn't know why. It doesn't fit into any mm. category. Exactly. And and what we normally have is we have this in a parent state, so they are. There they are built-in functions for this as well, but sometimes you want it more specific to your skill. Uh, and what I will often do is, is also add them to the specific state so it, it makes sense in that particular context. And this will make a robot feel a lot more intelligent. They will be rest, less repetitive, the whole interaction, uh, and so on. Uh, and maybe one last thing. I think I have it further down here. Um, so we have the built-in yes intents, but often you can say yes in in many uh, many ways, uh, which is not always means yes, but in, in this case it does. So it's important to to remember remember this. And of course, it's a lot of of testing your way forward, both with maybe a cognitive walkthrough of where you try to think how people might say it, but also with people. We'll it's, get back. Yeah, to it's that. very hard to predict what users would actually say. So you you need you want to test it and be a bit empirical um, in how you do it. Okay, uh, so I will stop. Sharing all right, now. let's talk a little about expression and gestures on the robot. Uh, you want to talk about pulsation? Yes. So. Um, you obviously want to add a lot of gestures to to make it more live, to not just be a you know uh, uh, to not make it so bland. But what is often forgotten is to spend time on pulsation. Um, so when I'm talking now, I'm mean, not just talking in the same way constantly, just like this, very monotonously. Right? We take pauses, we wait, uh, and this kind of thing is is very important for for how the robot is perceived and something you will probably need to spend more time on than you think from the start. <laughs> yep. Just adding little delays, sometimes just adding a delay of 200 milliseconds just mm. makes it feel better talking with the robot. Mm. Sure. Uh, should we show the timing demo? Yeah. Timing of expressions. Yeah, go ahead. So um, the uh, first can see if someone is smiling so sometimes putting together the right timing of an expression can also be tricky. To have it smile at the right time, or to um, um, we have some ex we have made some expressions that are like like that, where it's where it's it's accessing its memory and thinking uh, that those kind of gestures. And if the timing is off on them, it's it loses so much. So one thing we've developed is a, a smile back. We call this little function, and we use it in a lot of our uh, demos that we make, uh, because the timing of a smile, if you're smiling when someone else is smiling at you, often that timing is right. Like that's not a bad time to smile. So uh, with this, it will automatically smile when you smile at it. And to test it, uh, we have a, a it's going to tell a little joke, and then we will see uh, if it's, uh, it'll, and then it will smile back. Here. Why can't you explain puns to kleptomaniacs? They always take things literally. So that's when I smile. You can see how it's, uh, yeah. That was too. That's a little time delay. And uh, it, it's hard to show this, but when you're experiencing it yourself and it's telling a joke, and you start smiling halfway through the joke, and the robot smiles, it's it's quite a powerful experience. We had this happening before, sometimes on accident, before we developed the skills. It was something people would point out, oh, it smiled back at me. Can you see this? And we're like, yeah, soon. And now, <laughs> now we actually can. So it's, uh, it's a good, good feature to use. And one of the first things we put in into most, most of our skills that we make, I think. Yeah. Um, and some of these things we've uh, add, we try to work in as auto behaviors. So as we said, it takes some time to adding in all these these gestures all over the place. So we are working more and more with doing automatic behaviors that will will happen all the time, such as this smile back or or head movements, uh, or or um, like adding a little noise before saying a sentence, or accessing the memory when it's going to speak, uh, like little things like that that happen occasionally and just makes. The speech more varied. 
some of these things might yeah. be uh, more we might might talk more about them uh, yeah. later in a different setting but uh, and they might come out more and more but it's something we're experimenting with it's just hard because it's obviously a bit context dependent so it's not the same for every interaction yep uh, so i might play the skill there if you want to talk about voice gestures yes so um, uh, what some voices have uh, is something we call voice gestures um, where the you know you it's it's a pre-recorded sound sort of that hat. is in the <laughs> <laughs> so this was a skill that we made and yes. Nicholas made a behavior where, where they're always it's two kids fighting and they're arguing and now mm. So it's a little bit of sulking behavior. Sorry to cut yeah, you off. No, there. I just thought good, good it, to explain it, it needed some sulking. explanation. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, it's often funny when the robot is rude, actually. Uh, <sighs> so yeah, there we see one uh, yawn. There's uh, mm, ah. being a bit annoyed like this. Uh, so here we're here we've added in function where it will pick one out of many of these features. Um, this. Kid is a bit tired as well from all the fighting. I hate you. Uh, yeah, I don't hate you, perhaps, uh, but thank you. Uh, so it, it's quite useful. It's not something that every voice has, but with Perhat, you can use uh, multiple different uh, voice suppliers uh, also in the same skill. So we're actually switching between <sighs> different voices and voice suppliers uh, instantly within <sighs> the skill. And that enables you to use the different uh, characteristics and strength of different Twitch. voices, which, which is quite useful. Should mm -hmm. we turn off the insulting? Uh, oh yeah, uh, <laughs> insulting babe. Oh. <laughs> so um, meanwhile, uh, <clears throat> another thing that you can do when you're developing gestures is quite often you can find interesting workarounds. I'm going to find an example of that here. I'm going to try to share the screen. Where are we? Oh, first I have to find the right, okay. We made a dog character. Uh, and the sniffing there is interesting. You see the nose is moving a little bit. Um, yeah. So this is the robot getting an electric <laughs> shock. Uh, Perhaps I shouldn't have signed up for this. It's gonna be another shock here, I think. So I'm going to get back and talk about this as well. OK, you can stop screen sharing. I can't uh, stand it. You need to stop this. Where is it, Nicholas? Oh, great. <sighs> Those two examples. Uh, first, to make the dog sniffing, I looked at all the different phonemes uh, that are in, in basic parents in a gesture. And it turned out that when the the robot dog face did the, the, the noise M, the phoneme for M, the, the, the sort of upper nose mood. And so the sniffing sound, that's the dog saying M 20 times. Actually, it's not saying M, it's just using the phoneme. I'm, I'm a, I made a gesture where it, it does the phoneme for M 20 times. And uh, then we added the sound to it and it looks really, really nice. So it, that's a weird workaround. And another workaround is for the when the robot gets the electric shock. That's from an example that we're going to show a little clip of later on. Um, but I wanted you to see it a little bit closer up. The, it's um, uh, you can see it's changing a little bit, and that's just making several textures and uploading them to to the robot, and then switching between them pretty fast. It's like switching faces, but almost like the frames in an animation. That's another little trick. Yeah, it's it's quite useful. You can do. I mean, this is obviously the a little bit more advanced ways of of getting expressivity, but it's it's nice to do those. You know, everything is automated with normally with speech, so it's something you don't have to think about uh, normally. But uh, if you want to make something a little bit extra for your research, it's it's very possible. Yeah, and um, when you're developing an interaction, unless it's extremely instrumental. Uh, it's really nice to find some little surprises in there. That's another thing we're moving on now. <laughs> again, we're going to do um, because if everything is predictable, it is. It's really not fun. Imagine being at a party and you meet a person and you're having a conversation 
and you know exactly what they're going to say uh, before they say it. That's not interesting for very long. And it, it's the same. And robotic, we design robotic interactions. It, it, it can get very predictable and polite and simple. But that is the same as boring in many ways. So try to find, even if it's little surprises, things that people don't expect. And there will be more delight in it, and it will be a stronger interaction. Try not to be a form is something we say often. I mean, even if your goal is actually to sort of be a form, mm -hmm. just get in information <laughs> from the user in some way, uh, you really want to try to create as much variance as possible and, and find those little little surprises in there to make it engaging and, and interesting. And you will probably get better responses and happier users, users for it. Yep. You want to talk a bit about user engagement policy? We're going to mention how, because it's quite important, how interaction starts and how it ends. Uh, if the robot is there, there's no people, and now someone shows up. How does it start and end? Mm. So you mentioned, as you might have seen here, when we start, we actually walk in front of the robot, and that's how we start most uh, most of the skills start that a user enters in some way. Um, sometimes you might have a behavior before that, but but generally that's it uh, and what you can do is you can set different interaction spaces so you have an inner and an outer interaction zone and you know you might interact differently so when the user is coming fairly close in like this then maybe the robot looks up and when it gets a little bit closer then you look at the user and you say something um, and this you can design you know it depends on the context you're in if you're in a booth if you're in a big open space if you want multiple users, you, you need to adapt it to your specific skill. Uh, so you can change how sharp it is. You can change the width. So you, you might be able to only respond to the person standing right in front. So per default, it's a circle, but you can also make it into an ellipsis that, uh, in front of the robot. So you can re really tailor it to your needs. And it's, it's very important, I think, to test this out in real life as well to get right. <laughs> it's also important to think about that when a user leaves, the, the on user leave event triggers when uh, when people, the pe person's face vanishes for a little while. And it's, so, it's not instant. So if, if I just look at Nicholas and look back, it's not gonna vanish. There, there is a delay, but, but quite often people will look at a friend and say something and talk mm -hmm. for, for a little while. Yeah. And for, after, after a couple of seconds, the, they, they will vanish from the robot. And to just have the interaction end there, uh, like there's no person there, that's not very nice. So it's good. Uh, right now, we made a thing where there's, when that event triggers, then there's an additional delay of maybe seven, eight, 10 seconds, where if the user um, looks back, it's like nothing happened. And if they don't, then we assume that, okay, now they really are gone and we have to. Uh, um, restart the interaction. And this leads us on to our next topic, which is the physical environment, because obviously how you set this depends on, you know, is it a standing and a seat or a seated interaction? Is it, you mentioned lots of people around. Um, so, and, and in general, you need to adapt not only the interaction space, but a lot of your interaction uh, based on, on the context. It doesn't, you know, it is, a, it's not a digital product, it's a physical one, uh, it's a physical experience. Um, so depending on, you know, what type of language you use, which responses you pick up, how maybe if you need a, a GUI or not, as a complement, can depend, is it private or is it a public space, for instance? Yeah, and you want to think a bit about noise, uh, noise levels and light. Um, the, the robot comes with an internal microphone and also an array microphone, like the little puck uh, right here, which is great. And it can, can be used a bit to tell what direction speech is coming from. Uh, but if it's a really noisy environment, you could also plug in a boom mic and try to just pick up the sound from a very particular uh, place. Uh, and light is also interesting. It, the first, it can actually surprisingly well recognize people uh, in, in dark environments. Uh, but if it's going to be a dark environment, you might want to put a light on it and um, on the people. And uh, you often want to avoid to having uh, the first in too strong sunlight because the added light will drown out the um, projector. So you, people, the users won't notice the expressivity and the finer details of what is happening yeah. on, on the face. But if you're in a dark environment, for instance, there might be a much higher chance of 
the on user leave event triggering because the robot thinks they're not there. So you have to plan some things like this. Into Should it. be said, the, the robot actually picks up people in surprisingly dark dark places. Yep. Uh, so you don't need to worry too much about that. It's more about how the robot is perceived by the users, I think. Do you yeah. want to demo the humor skill to bring yeah, us I into our next? Yeah, I think we can both, uh, maybe both come oh, in yeah. here, because here we are. Uh, Could I try out a few jokes on you? Uh, all right. Yeah. How convenient. Why can't you explain puns to kleptomaniacs? They always take things literally. Oh, that's a terrible dad joke. Dad. I don't care what you say, all of you smiled so I'll consider that a good one. Would you consider one more? Uh, all right. I beg your pardon but that was incomprehensible. A few jokes is unlikely to kill you, so I will interpret that as yes. Don't trust atoms. They make up everything. That's terrible. Terrible joke. That's harsh. Terrible. Oh, really bad joke. Noted. Care for one more? No, no. I think we are <laughs> down there. Um, so here, there's a lot of situational awareness uh, going on. And uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, knows which of us was smiling at what point. It can tell how, how much we're smiling. It um, uh, you, you also saw how it fed back the word to us that we were saying, which mm. is is a strong thing. Mm. And we're we're trying to use the um, where who's speaking, where the sound is coming from. It's not very robust, and when we're standing as close as we did now, it doesn't have a have a chance, quite frankly. Um, however, what is quite what it is quite good at in general is picking up who smiled. Yeah, uh, yeah it's not going to make a mistake on that. That's mm. quite robust. And it's, it's also actually stronger on where the user is looking, like the direction. Um, and you can really use that to your advantage. Like if, if, I'm, if I'm talking to you, I'm unlikely to look away for a long time, especially when I'm handing over the turn. You know, I'm, I don't ask you a question like, oh, and what do you think? And then instantly look away. So you can assume that the user will continue talking or, and stuff like that uh, based on those things. Yeah, uh, it's also really strong to remember things like uh, user's name and information. Yeah. Like we're going to uh, <laughs> run through this and to know where things are in the room is really great. Like if you oh, pick up one of our flyers from over there and nodding to the thing, like just showing that it understands the environment. Knowing the user's head position is also interesting. Like if it's in a museum and uh, and a user comes in and, and they're looking at the painting over there, the robot can look at them and go, oh, you, you like the Van Gogh? I really like it too. It's, it's from 1782. Like there's a strong experience and it knows where, where people are looking. Um, and it's also strong when it's controlling the environment around it. Uh, we have done some demos where we had the skill uh, control some uh, Wi-Fi lamps so it can like dampen the volume or have uh, the, the the color change in the room and that can be really flicker the lights at the right yeah. moment to create some suspense and this sort of thing. Um... Right. So let's talk a little bit about testing. We're going to try to get to the end of this fairly quickly. Uh, when you're testing, uh, the uh, first the SDK and and the robots have a really nice built-in feature, which is virtual users. So you can add virtual users to um, that the first thinks is there, and this is. Is really handy, especially if you're developing something, an interaction for three people, for instance. Then you don't have to keep two friends around to test it. But so you are going to need to test things both yourself with the robot and also with real users. I mean, for us and for a start, it's good to pull in people, yes, to to try it out uh, because people will say things you could not come up with. Like we all think in different ways, and I guarantee you'll be surprised every time. Um, and eventually you'll need to move on to, to real real users and uh, they will say things you couldn't predict yeah. for sure. Uh, uh. And the more real you can can make this situation, the better. Um, so that's part leads us into the, the one of the last bits here, which is like you need to iterate on your skill and on your design. You're never gonna make it and it's gonna be perfect and you can just deploy it like 
uh, expect that when you start doing it and start testing it, you're going to have to take it back, work on it, and, and put it out. Because sometimes really surprising things happen. I can take an example with, with Penguide, the um, recruitment robot, where you know, we did tests with hundreds of users before we started doing real job interviews. But then when there was an actual job on the line, people behaved completely different that we couldn't simulate in, in tests. For instance, people would speak for, for minutes on end, several minutes, just to answer one question. And this had sort of never happened in, in user testing. So we ended up with a, with a lot of issues there. So always test and, and iterate. Mm -hmm. And a way to help speed up your development we are doing this is to use the wizard buttons, which you can easily add. It's like one line of code to add buttons into the interface. And maybe you have an interaction that takes several minutes and you want to test what, something that's three minutes into the interaction. It's really nice to have wizard buttons that can take you to different parts of the interaction. You can just jump straight there uh, and test different, different things like that. Uh, that's really handy. And you can also use uh, wizard buttons to race um, intense. So if it asks you a question, like a yes or no question, it gets really annoying to your colleagues in the office if they constantly hear you be like, yes, no, yes. And you can just add a button that that raises. So it, it's as if someone said yes, and uh, then it's, it's a little bit nicer. It's also good to use them to make your skill sort of semi-automated. So you can have it run autonomously on the robot. Uh, maybe you start deploying it, but since it's perhaps a high stakes situation, uh, you can also sit there uh, behind the scenes and be the wizard of us and actually click when the robot fails or doesn't pick up as fast as you want or the right one, or you've made a mistake and it goes to the wrong state or whatever it is. So it's it's very useful. And obviously the user won't need to know this. Uh, and this is something that's quite good for, especially in research tasks, I would say. So, yeah. Uh, okay, let's talk a little bit. We're reaching the last topic here, which is um, uh, the concept of robot death. So death is, um, is a term we've taken from puppetry. It's, I guess, similar to a stand-up comedian dying on stage uh, when the audience are not liking them. But in, to puppets, puppeteers apply the concept of death to the puppet when, when it turns, when something happens and the robot turns from being an, an, um, an individual that you project emotions onto uh, into just being a dead piece of wood, essentially. Like, it can be that the head turns in the wrong way and it just dies. The illusion vanishes. Mm. And it, it's really nice with uh, the fur to try to maintain, to try to avoid death mm. in that sense. We call it the suspension of disbelief. I mean, most people on a logical plane, they know that this is just a piece of plastic and electronics, uh, a robot essentially. But in the moment when they're interacting, they are treating it as a person. And we see this time, time and time again, uh, where they, they behave in the same way as they would with a person. And they forget uh, midway through the interaction that is, it's actually not the person. Yeah. Basically. So well, let's go through this uh, fairly quickly here. So yeah, you want it to be moving a little bit when it's just completely still for a long time. You can see we've added little auto movements to this. Occasionally it moves its head and that, that is, is a, a nice thing. Um, you want to go? Yeah, really, really movement is to be alive. So you don't want to, to miss on that. Um, situational awareness, we talked quite a bit about. So, but all those things is really showing, you know, it's what makes a strong interaction when the robot shows that it knows what's going mm. on. It's not just a dumb robot. And you want it to not be repetitive, like we talked about in the language, um, to try to have variance in the speech. And it's really good. It, it dies if it's if it's forgetting that it's already talked about something. So keep track of what it's been saying. You want to be as relevant and specific as you can to what the user said, and that really comes down to working, uh, spending time on the end value that we talked about, whether it's a real application or research. Yeah, and you can use the fact that robots can often keep track of who spoke, who smiled, where are people in relation to it, uh, where are people looking, where are objects around it that might have a, a relevance to the to the interaction. And trying to pick up these well-timed things, you know, when the robot winks at the, the right moment or laughs or, uh, or smiles at you. Um, 
also the pulses, all of this. If you, the more you can get them to happen at the right time, the more it will feel alive. Yeah, and it's great to have relevant and specific responses to to alternative paths that the user takes. I think uh, that is. Yeah, we should over remember uh, we are out of time. Yeah. Uh, so. <laughs> yes. Uh, thanks a lot, guys. Uh, I, I muted you so we can't hear you right now. Uh, thanks a lot. There's so much to talk about when it comes to the art of creating skills. And as you hear, there's, it's, it's not really enough room to talk about just in a, in a four to five minute session like this. Uh, I promised you we're going to do some questions, Q&A. Uh, if you have to leave uh, now, we'll say uh, thank you so much for joining us today. And uh, for those who you can stay, uh, you can stay a little bit longer and we can uh, take some of those questions that we've been getting. Uh, so for another five or 10 minutes or so, and then we'll uh, wrap up. So uh, let me jump into the questions here. Um, so uh, you talked there about uh, surprises, uh, adding some surprises in the interaction. Uh, and the question is, can you give some more examples of what those surprises uh, could be? And uh, make sure to unmute yourself there first. Yep. Yeah, I think we talked about, about emotion, like strong emotion from a robot is often uh, a big surprise. Like we're used to these um, smart speakers and so on, and they're always polite and flat. When, but when a robot does have a character, that is usually something that uh, surprises. Yeah. Or maybe asking like something that's not necessarily totally related to to it, like bringing up going in another direction. To just temper. It just has to be a little little thing um i mean one way to think about it is like how how do would people you expect the robot to behave right now and then just trying to find something little else to do um it's i mean it's quite interaction specific but i would say avoiding the just polite completely bland very like um instrumental language different things would obviously surprise different people, but generally a lot of these, the more expressive you, you make it, the more likely it is to be surprising. A smile back can be a surprise. Uh, one of these voice gestures, coughing suddenly is, can, uh, can really create that sense of surprise that we want. Uh, great, uh, thanks a lot guys. Um, another question we had here was uh, regarding the expressivity of the voice and the tts voice you mentioned that it can get a little bit monotonous if it just it keeps on talking for too long uh, and do you have any tips and tricks for how to make that uh, voice or that robot sound less monotonous even if you would maybe you need to have that three sentence uh, paragraph or one monologue so if you have some tips and tricks that you can share with us that would be great Um, yeah, I mean, yeah. I think we use, uh, as I mentioned, a bit, the, we can use the different uh, voice uh, types of voices, different suppliers. Uh, currently, we are using quite a bit uh, the Amazon neural voices. They're strong. In, They're the best voices if you're just going to use one voice and it's just going to talk. They're more, most natural. Mm. But then others like Acapella has a lot more in the voice gestures and so on. So. Uh, you can switch around um, and also, but also between the Amazon voices. So what we've done lately is we're switching from uh, maybe the neural voice normally and then to the not neural voice when we want to spend a bit of extra time because then you have these tags so you can put emphasis and so on. Whispering different, like you can change the pace. You can change the speed that the neural voice is saying something like the neural Matthew can't change the speed that it's saying something, but you can change the speed of normal Matthew. So you can speak with neural Matthew mostly, and then you want to say something slow, and you go to that voice and use that a little bit. I think maybe the rate is working for both now, but yeah, I'm not, yeah okay. I'm not sure. Uh, yeah. It keeps changing, it keeps updating. So, so you'll need you'll need to look at the, the latest and greatest from. But the non neural voices have some abilities that the neural ones doesn't, and they, it can be good to know. So sometimes if you want to be spend a lot of time on a few specific ones, you can go in, you can put uh, change the rates, put the emphasis, add pauses, inside utterance and, and so on as well. Yeah, and, and also you want to like fiddle around with the wordings. That's mm -hmm. also a secret. To, if something if you can't find if something doesn't sound good, then try to say it in a synonymous way. Uh, try to rewrite it using different words. And sometimes that will sound much better. 
but in general, check in SSML tags on the supplier's websites. We also have some Furhat specific ones that pick up for different ones, but you can read about it on docs as well. Uh, great, uh, thanks guys for that uh, for those tips and tricks. Uh, I also remember you've been doing one time uh, something that we had when you add sort of automatic variants of just the, the volume or the, the 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 rate of the speaker that I thought was was kind of nifty and to get that automatic behavior that you don't have to have always designing in this these coughings or, or, or coughings that were uh, coughs uh, <laughs> or or these kind of things. Uh, so great, and like like Niklas said, there's a lot of inf more information about this in the docs, so you can read uh, more about uh, these SSML tags and stuff on the docs. Uh, so we have, uh, I think we have time for maybe two more questions. Uh, so let's let's jump into the uh, first one here. Uh, I think this is someone who might have attended our our computer vision webinar where we talked about um, uh, the different capabilities of the robot to pick up. Um, uh, the emotions on the user and we talked about the smile detection and you show us some examples of that uh, but the question here is uh, have you tried using any of the other emotions that the robot is at least technically possible to to pick up uh, and i know those are anger and sadness and uh, surprise uh, so is that something we, we've tried doing or we were thinking about uh, doing it or is, is the smile detection really the most uh, useful one Yeah, so as uh, Nils mentioned, uh, it is possible to pick up more emotions. Um, we didn't want to, well, while we were developing this and testing it, we could see that the other emotions are not really reliable. Like they don't, um, it's not as robust as we normally want it when we make interactions. So we don't feel it's something you can rely on so much. Um, so that's the general, maybe the, the response mm -hmm. don't rely on it because, you know, with the smile, we sometimes rely on if the user smiled or not. It, and that determines how we go in the interactions. Uh, maybe, but maybe have that extra little surprise if someone does manage, does manage to show to pick up uh, one of the other emotions. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I've experimented with it, but not successfully. <laughs> <laughs> but you can get the values uh, and all of it, and then I mean, you can you can uh, try it out yourself as it, well. I mean, if if one of your researchers out there is manages to to use it successfully, we will be very interested. It's also something that will get more reliable over time. I think yes. so. Then there will be a release at some point uh, where it's like, oh, suddenly now you can rely on it a lot more. Uh, great. Uh, we have uh, one more question here. It's a really good one. Uh, if you have any final questions, uh, shoot them now. There may be some time for, for one final final question. Uh, but this question is about uh, the learning capabilities. Uh, have we ever tried creating an application or a skill that sort of learns or at least maybe adapts to the user behavior while doing the interaction? And maybe you can just tell us a little bit about uh, how that can be done or if you have any experience on, on that. Um, yeah, I mean, we there's different ways. Uh, it's it's not so easy to make it automatically become better over time, but uh, different ways. The joke, the humor learner that we should demo is one example. It definitely adapts its responses to how the user responds to something, and then it actually saved those joke responses in a database, so it's kept uh, even when the robot is turned off. It remembers which jokes are highly ranked. In the in the list, um, we, we also use <laughs> counters sometimes to sort of see how often did the user smile or how often did things go wrong, and then uh, it changes the behavior later based based on that. Um, in general, though, this is something that takes a fair bit of time to do. Usually, uh, yeah, some some things are easier and some some are more complicated. But obviously, almost pretty much every. Interaction will make branches depending on how the user responds. Hmm. Um, yeah, for sure. If you can give an example of something, we can uh, maybe talk a little bit about how we, it would be done. But hmm. um, it depends what it is. is maybe the... Yeah, it's also hard to. Uh, currently, the the facial recognition is not maintained really uh, over long periods of time, mainly because of GDPR reasons. And that it's, it just leads, it's such a quagmire. Um, so there's less, 
we haven't really stumbled upon things where we need a lot of learning to to be persistent. Um, but yeah, but it is really nice when you can. Uh, the more as it's it's a bit of situational awareness, right? You see what the user is yeah. doing and you react <laughs> to it. And it's very easy to have user data to give different data to different users, like the. Um, the fortune teller we had, we did a fortune teller for the Nobel Prize after party, and the, that one remembered who it had already read its fortune to, and so it wouldn't tell the same person a fortune twice, unless they left for a while and then came back like a while later, then it wouldn't remember them, but uh, Uh, great. Uh, I think our time is up there, guys. Uh, you had your chance to post a last question. I didn't get one. So I think we'll uh, wrap this up. Uh, so thank you all for tuning into today's uh, webinar. Uh, uh, you can check out, this is a webinar series, and you can check out the previous uh, episodes uh, on our website. Uh, at the top there, there's a button for Meet Us Online and where you can, you can find uh, previous sessions and upcoming webinars. We have one next week that we will be doing with the University of Darmstadt. We're talking a little bit about how to use the robot in uh, the field of HRI. Uh, and if we tickled your interest for creating skills with us here today, uh, you can request the SDK and start playing around uh, with, you for, with, with it yourself. Uh, and you can request it from uh, furhat.io. Uh, and there's a very good guide to get started, uh, the tutorials, code examples, etc., to get you going. So check that out uh, and let us know if there's anything uh, you need help with getting that up and running. Uh, um, I'm also hoping to do a series of workshops with a little more hands-on approach for learning uh, the platform and building skills. Uh, so make sure to subscribe to our developer newsletter to get invited to those or use, you know, follow us on our social media channels uh, so you get invitations uh, for those because I think those could be uh, really valuable for, for a lot of you who are attending uh, this webinar. Uh, all right, so again, uh, thank you so much for joining. Uh, have a great rest of the day and uh, don't forget to smile.